Perfect. Okay, so this lecture is going to be on exploratory factor analysis, and it's just going to be kind of a way for us to ease into structural equation modeling. So I've talked a little bit about how SIM is regression on steroids, and that really is what EFA is as well. And I think EFA uh, gives us a good window into a lot of the analyses we're going to do starting next week. Um, and it's like uh, the first a, a series of analyses that we'll do is on confirmatory factor analysis. So that follows exploratory factor analysis. It's not the first model we'll start with because we'll actually start with path analysis, which is just a good way to kind of um, learn some of the terms in SIM and some of the, the basic considerations, but then we'll move on to CFA. So I always found it easy to start with EFA to kind of like get us thinking and get our heads in the right space for SIM. So some terminology first. We have um, usually in our data set, the measured variables, right? So measured variables are the real scores from some sort of experiment, some scale, some survey, something. Okay? They can be either from people or from data that you have. So you could have data on states, okay? And those would be real scores. So this is a literal numbers in your data set are the measured variables. Sometimes these are called manifest variables. And they're present in, um, in, a, in the sim style pictures as a square on the diagram. So squares are things that are measured. Latent variables are the underlying construct that the measured variables are meant to represent. And so we don't really directly measure a latent variable. We measure it through these observations on the manifest or measured variables. So latent variables are what we're trying to capture with all of our numbers in our data set. Okay, so they're not measured directly, and they're usually represented by circles on a diagram. But so here I've used Levon, um, and we aren't looking at the code on how to do this just yet because uh, that's a different lecture. But here I've used Levon to just kind of print us a, a picture of what I meant. And this is the example code from their CFA page, where we have three underlying latent variables here um, on the intelligence test, I believe, so visual, text, and speed. And so they're represented by these circles. Then each of these squares down here are the manifest or measured variables, which are the actual columns in the data set. So x1, x2, x3 represent some sort of measurement that relates to this visual latent variable. 4, 5, and 6 are things that represent some sort of text. And 7, 8, and 9 represent speed. Okay, this is a classic famous data set, which I'll try not to use too much because it's not that exciting of a data set. Um, but this is what you might see if somebody presents some structural equation model to you. And so we're getting used to this idea that we have these measured variables and we want to know what kind of latent variables there are. So what kind of constructs we're measuring with them. So factor analysis really attempts to achieve parsimony. And I can think of that as like data reduction. So parsimony is like simplifying the, the data set from a large number of variables to a small number of variables. So instead of 500 questions, you might get it down to six latent variables. And we do that by explaining the maximum number, amount of common variance in a correlation matrix. So we have every item by every other item. Okay, so our nice correlation triangle. And we're trying to group them together by saying, well, these are all highly intercorrelated. These are all related together. So they must be measuring the same thing. Because otherwise, why would you get the same correlation? Now, there are ways to get the same correlation that don't have them measuring the same thing. And that's where you get into validity questions. But what we're going to focus on is just the mathematical question first. Can I group together common items? And we want to use the smallest number of exploratory constructs or factors to describe these items. And that common variance is just the overlapping variance between items. 
Okay, so unique variance is unaccounted for variance. Total variance would be everything. Um, and unique variance isn't very good in this situation. Okay, sometimes this is called error variance, but it's the variance that you don't know why it's happening. Hey, no problem. Good to see you. Okay, this mouse and I, we're not friends tonight. Okay, so unique variance is just the error. It's the, the variance that you can't explain. It's not due to a factor. It's due to something else. It might be the participant being whoever they are, or it might be some variable you didn't measure. And then an important note I want to add is that factors are thought to cause the measured variables. If we, you know, we spend a lot of time with regression thinking about prediction, right? Y is predicted by X. And that's how this works as well, because EFA is regression on steroids. And um, the direction of the arrow is important. So we're saying that these measured variables down here are predicted by that factor. And that, I feel like sometimes it's a hard concept for folks because that's not, this like circle is not a number in our data set. So how am I using some non-number to predict my real numbers in the data set? So we're creating these sort of latent structures, um, and we can create latent means, okay, which is like a sort of a representation of the score on that factor for a participant or for a row of data. Um, but basically, we're saying that these three, you know, X, 1, 2, and 3, are the reason that those scores happen is because of this underlying latent variable. And while I hate to use IQ as an example, sometimes because it's kind of over overused IQ is kind of a tricky concept what we think is happening when people take these IQ tests right is that you get the score you get because of your underlying IQ right your underlying ability um, is what causes those scores okay I don't get an IQ because I'm really good at a block span test okay, which is a famous one or better yet a personality scale I answer those uh, openness questions uh, in a similar way because of my inherent openness. And it's not that me answering the questions makes up my openness. So magically I've answered these scales and suddenly I become neurotic, right? Um, what's happened is I was neurotic before and that's why I answered the scales that way. To give the, uh, the big five, which is um, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Also some kind of famous factor structures. And so that causal direction is going to be really important next week. And so I just wanted to kind of start by warming you up to that idea now. So why would I use an EFA? And I'm going to approach this from the, from the perspective of scale development mostly because that is what one of my expertise is in. It's thinking about how we did that um, create good measurement scales. So let's say you're working for your boss and they're like, hey, we want to send out a survey to our users. You can think about, you know, what's a good way to word this item or what's a good way to ask questions. And so I have helped develop many scales now. But at its core, it's really to understand what is happening in this set of variables. So don't have to use it on survey data. That's just an easy example for us to look at. Um, so, but it's just like, what is, what is going on? What can I glean from what's happening in these sets of variables? This is really how a lot of uh, natural language processing models work as well. So like topic analysis is kind of a different form of EFA. It allows us to maybe construct a scale to measure some sort of latent variable. So purpose personality tests, IQ, um, a lot of people are really interested right now, given the political elections, um, there's a famous scale called the right-wing authoritarianism scale that measures exactly what it sounds like. Um, and maybe that'll help us predict things if we think that scale is any good, right? Uh, could also use it to just reduce the data set. And it still measures meaningful information 
um, about the original questions. A lot of analysts also like to use PCA or principal components analysis. We're going to focus here mostly on EFA because of the relationship to confirmatory factor analysis when we get into that section. So this example data set we're going to use is from the Andy Field book and it's um, a scale that a joking scale or you might be making it into something real uh, that measures anxiety and that statistics provokes in students and the questions are very funny so things like statistics makes me cry uh, my friends will think I'm stupid for not being able to cope with R right standard deviations excite me which makes me laugh but notice here that it's a reverse coded that's an item that is in the opposite direction and there's much more Pearson attacking me with correlations I don't understand, I have a little experience, computers hate me, that's true tonight for me, I've never been good at math, my friends are better than I am, computers are for games, no math, um, <laughs> people tell you R is great, <laughs> uh, computers, 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 <laughs> I weep at the mention of central tendency, I find these quite funny. Um, equations, there's a really funny one on eigenvectors that I'm trying to get to. Everybody looks at me when I use R. There, I can't sleep for thoughts of eigenvectors because we will talk about eigenvalues tonight. And so there's 23 questions total. Go down to the bottom here. And we're going to try to see if we can um, see what items are good on this scale and what items don't work and how we might group these together into factors. Right away, I can I can just looking at the themes that are present in the questions. There seem to be questions about math, computers, and programming. Okay, so maybe there's three factors, maybe not. And so I could go through and like give a basic label to which ones I think they might be. But that's only one part of that. That's my theory on how this should go. All right, so our example data set here, so just another example here of Rio importing the data set. You will need the psych library. Psych is easily one of my all-time favorite packages because I do a lot of EFA, and it's also just a really great, well-documented package. So huzzah for psych. And I just printed out the top six rows here with the head function. So I can see the only thing in this data set are questions 1 through 23. And then I have our traditional Likert scale of 1 to 5, it looks like. So we're going to focus on kind of three or four big steps to the analysis. Uh, we're going to skip data screen screening because we did that last week, but you would normally do data screening and eliminate outliers if you felt like it, make sure there wasn't any missing data, etc. Um, but an ad additional component to that data screening is that the type of EFA I'm going to show you today assumes that you have at least interval measurement. And so we could argue over whether or not Likert scales are interval. Um, they might be considered ordinal, sort of a rank choice. But for today's purposes, we're going to treat them as interval. But do know you can use EFA on non-interval data. I'm just not showing you that set of options tonight. So it is possible you just change the um, type of correlation or the type of math you're using. Uh, but tonight we're going to focus on interval measurement. And then you need items. The purpose of this analysis is to cluster, not cluster, that's a different analysis, is to group items together based on their intercorrelations. And so if you only have four items, you can't do a lot of grouping. And the minimum suggestion is three to four items per potential factor. And so this is like the one time I'll say this, that the more variables, the better. Um, you do still have to have more people, more rows than columns, but the more variables, the better. Because then if an item is bad, you can get rid of it. And you haven't really lost a whole lot. So you can't do this on a small data set. And so uh, kind of an example, we were working on a scale over the last couple of years, 
and we came up with our own questions and then gave them to people and we had 200 plus items. The final version of the scale has 18 and so we were able to whittle down to only the best items. And people hated the 200 version, but we paid them, so it worked out okay. So the, the next step after data screening and making sure we have enough data, really, is how many factors should I use? So discovering the potential number of underlying factors. Then we'll talk about once you know the factor numbers, what, what can you do to... Um, to build the best model, we're going to call this simple structure, and then determine if that simple structure meets an adequate solution or makes an adequate model fit. Okay, so I've always just called this adequate solution because our versions of good model might be slightly different, but essentially you could have a model that meets the rules for simple structure but is not a very good fitting model. And we'll see a lot of bad models this semester, <laughs> just to show you like good and the bad and the how do I fix this. So let's jump into how many factors should I use when exploring for an EFA. Well, I might have a theory. So our potential scale development, we had a theory that we maybe would get two or three. And I will also talk about a scale, it's the fight, flight, or freeze scale published with some colleagues. And there's three of those, fight, flight, and freeze. Okay, we wanted three. And so the theory was three and we wanted it to be three. Now it's not always how it worked out, but that was where we started. I often um, help others with their scales and so sometimes they don't have a good theory. So we go, okay, well, we don't have a good answer for that. So you may not know theory-wise. The old set of rules, which is called the Kaiser Criterion, and we're going to look at each of these on a slide. Uh, scree plots and a parallel analysis. So let's start with those last two. The Kaiser Criterion is kind of an older rule, but I feel like if you don't teach it to people, then when you see somebody use it, you won't know what it is. And so it is this idea that we should extract or use the number of factors. When you see extract, people are talking about, you know, calculating a model, creating a, a picture of the data that has that many factors. So extract a number of factors where the eigenvalue is over one. I will get to eigenvalues in just a second. Okay. Now there's a newer rule that suggests that Matt might be a little optimistic, and so we should extract a number of eigenvalues over 0.7. I, I don't know what the current feeling is on Kaiser, except that a lot of people suggest the parallel analysis and the scree plot are more informative. Uh, I would say that sometimes it's a good confirmation of, of, of a set of a, a factor structure to try, and it doesn't really hurt you to look at it. I would not base my whole analysis on this one criterion. Now, what the heck is an eigenvalue? So, eigenvalues are a mathematical representation of variance. So the idea is we're taking our, our triangle plot, our correlation matrix, and we're grouping together the ones that have high intercorrelations. So we've actually got a covariance matrix, right? We, we have all this variance hanging out, and we're trying to find where we can like, okay, this set of variance goes together and this set of variance goes together. And so an eigenvalue is a mathematical representation of the pockets of variance. You have some sort of total amount of variance and the numbers get divided up based on which one is grabbing the most variance. But the issue with eigenvalues is they're not really scale, they're not really bounded in the sense that um, in one analysis a six might be quite large and in another analysis a two might be large. So there's this rule here, you know, kind of based on the different math at the time, is like, well, usually things over one are kind of a lot. But I don't know that I've seen that work consistently because 
Uh, it's not like eigenvalues, there's always at least two over one or something. Okay? So they're not scaled in a good way. So instead, we might consider, or in addition to, we might consider looking at a scree plot. So what we get are eigenvalues, one for every um, column of data that is put in. So for every measured variable, we get one eigenvalue. Many of, a couple of those eigenvalues should be large because they represent a lot of the variance in the data. And then a lot of those will be small where they're representing only the unique variance left over for an item. And it's always kind of, I feel like this is a question I get a lot. Why are there as many as there are measured variables? And that's because we got to account for all that variance somewhere. So we took all the variance, put it in a pot. Right? We're dishing out the largest pots first. Okay, but there's still some soup left, so to speak. We usually talk about cookies, not soup. We'll go soup tonight since the weather's been bad. Um, and so you essentially are partitioning out the variance. And you could have up to 20, in this case, 23. Um, there's 23 questions. Small little clusters of variance. Right? But we don't really want all of those unique small variances. We're only going to take the big large ones. And so a scree plot is um, all the factors lined up in order, so largest to smallest, plotted their eigenvalues. And you're looking for what's called the bend. The, it, sometimes this is called the elbow rule or the scree, where if you like throw a rock down a hill, this is where it stops rolling. Um, and so you count the number of eigenvalues that are larger than the inflection point. So there's lots of different names for this, the scree, the elbow, the inflection point. Essentially, you want to find where it levels off and pick the number of points above that. So this graph has it drawn on here. So this is pretty level. And by leveling off, I don't mean like flat. I mean like the drop between each one is pretty consistent and small. So there's only one factor. In this example, it levels off and there's two factors, one, two. Now that's just the plot. The parallel analysis is actually a statistical test that tells me how many eigenvalues are greater than chance. So what it does is it calculates the real eigenvalues for the data, scrambles up the data, and recalculates those eigenvalues, and then compares them to see you know, how much variance can we account for if the data is truly random. Because in that variance, is not good, right? You don't want a randomized data set to match your real data because that implies that your data is random. So let's look how to do this. So this part is in psych and the code here is fa.parallel. Mouse is like double clicking. So let's use this here and highlight. There we go. So fa.parallel, the first argument is the data frame, which we just imported earlier as master. The second argument here is the type of math you want to do. And so this is what you might change if you have a, a data set that doesn't meet your assumptions or is not integral. We're going to do ML for maximum likelihood. We'll talk more about that in a second. And this last argument here is, do you want factor analysis? Do you want PCA or do you want both? And we only want to really see factor analysis because that's what we're doing. I have saved it as a separate variable, and that just allows me to do some calculations in a second. So let me scroll down here. So our cool plot here, what happens? So this solid line right here is our original Kaiser criterion. So I can already tell that that's going to be one of them is greater. And we'll calculate that manually in a minute. Then we've got the, um, the, two, the blue line here is the scree plot. So I can just look at that and go, wow, that looks like one. Like one giant factor and then the rest of it kind of levels off. 
and um, I'd love for you to interrupt if you're not seeing why I'm seeing that, but it's just like one factor up here, and then everything else just kind of flattens out. But then when we calculate our randomized data set, and we've got our um, dotted, small dotted line and our dashed line, and you'll see that I have never seen them separate. I, they're always kind of on top of each other. Uh, so if you can create graph where they separate, let me know what you did, because I have never seen it do it. But this is meant to be the comparison of the eigenvalues when the data is random. And so you can see we never get these like big ones up here. So that's a good sign that that's a real grouping of variants. And just in case you have a hard time figuring out if it's like one, two, three, four, five, or does this one count here? What you'll see is it always, <laughs> I cannot figure out how to turn this off, it always spits out this text. Parallel analysis suggests and it tells you how many. So it suggests six factors. So one, let's see, where does it cross, I guess? One, two, three, four, five, six. So it's counting the cross like here. And so it finds where these two cross and picks everything above it. Now six factors for 23 items is kind of a lot. So we want parsimony, simple solutions. Right? So six seems kind of excessive. But let's see what the Kaiser criterion tells us. So my theory was two or three, right? Math, computers, programming. And now computers and programming are heavily connected, so maybe it's math and computers. So I can go two or three. This suggests six. Uh, my scree plot really suggests one to me. So what do we have? One, two, three, and six. And then let's calculate our eigenvalues. So I saved that output simply to be able to, um, to sum here. And so what we have is the sum of the FA values. I don't know why they're called FA values. I find, find that kind of confusing personally because I don't know what a factor analysis value should be because there are several things that you can get out of a factor analysis. but that's what those are in the background. So the sum of them that are greater than one, there's one, okay, just like we saw in our plot. And then the sum of them that are greater than 0.7 is two. So we've got two votes for one, a couple votes for two, one vote for three, theory-wise, and one vote for six. Now here's what's cool. You could run all of those models, one, two, three, and six, and compare them. I won't do that because we have a finite amount of time, but that is sometimes what we, um, what I've done. What you'll find usually is that the larger number of factors, so if I went for six, those models tend to, once you start weeding out the, the bad parts of them, tend to reduce down into the smaller ones. And so real larger numbers like the five, six, seven, and mores, um, don't tend to work, in my experience. Uh, I have had models where I've had one factor, but in this case we're going to try two, just so that you can see what it looks like when there's more than one. And so that some of this other stuff makes sense. All right, so now we know. That's step one. How many items should I have? <clears throat> So let's take that and run the analysis and see if we can come up with what's called simple structure. Okay, what is simple structure? Well, it's two parts. The way we achieve it and the interpretation. Okay, so how do I achieve it? Well, one, I have to pick a type of math. And the math we're going to use is, in this case, is maximum likelihood. There are other types of math, like weighted least squares, asymptotically distribution-free, there's a bunch of versions of weighted least squares, generalized least squares. And then we could get even further into it um, and do some uh, ordinal type of data, but we're going to save that for the end of the semester and do item response theory. So we're going to focus on max likelihood. 
what maximum likelihood does in kind of a simple uh, explanation is it searches for the parameter you're trying to estimate and calculates the kind of the probability of all these different parameters right, and picks the one that's most likely. Um, the parameter we're trying to estimate here is the factor loading. And we want our factor loadings to make sense. So what we're going to do to help us interpret our factor loadings is rotate our analysis. So we're going to pick a math, the most common type here being maximum likelihood. There's also principal axis factoring, so I'll just remember some more, um, and principal components. But then we're also going to pick a rotation. And what a rotation does is it allows us to take our regression on steroids and tweak it so that it, the um, solution is maximally interpretable. So let's look at that. So let's say we have two factors, because we do in this example. Okay, so two factors is easy to see in dimensional space where one factor um, it's one dimension, another factor is another dimension. If you've ever looked at multidimensional scaling, or sometimes you can get these pictures out of cluster analysis. Gosh, there's another one that's jumped right out of my head. But anyways, these kind of pictorial representations of, of, of the multidimensional space. All right, so we've got factor one and factor two. An orthogonal rotation requires that the two factors be uncorrelated. So that means they cannot share variance, and so their solutions have to be, at basically, when you draw them in space, 90 degree angles from each other. And so theta here has to stay at 90. And we can't um, bend them. So when you turn an orthogonal rotation, you're still trying to best capture the data points. So we have all of our questions here, all of our questions here, and we're trying to turn it in such a way that each factor maximally represents those points, those groups of variance. And so that's where the loadings come in. The loading is how much each item represents that factor. And so this is essentially the, the the weight, the beta weight, of the latent variable predicting the factor. Or some people talk about it as the correlation between factor and item. Same thing. Now, interpretation-wise, an orthogonal rotation makes a lot, of, a lot of kind of thought sense because at least they're, they're completely different things from each other. Right? So we're forcing the variances to be totally separate and they're not, the factors are not correlated. And that sounds appealing until you think about this for about two more minutes, at least in psychology. Um, what I'm saying is that I have put all of these items together on one survey instrument and then forced them to not be related. Then why are they all together on one survey instrument? Okay. So if I have a bunch of questions about um, the big five, I know these things are intercorrelated. Personality is very messy. And so why would I force them to be uncorrelated? Instead, we can do an oblique rotation where, and I don't think this picture is like totally great. Sorry, Andy. This picture could be better. <laughs> um, but the idea is that we, we allow them to not be at 90 degree angles. So we got two thetas now. Um, and we can sort of allow their, uh, the two factor equations to be correlated and so our latent variables are related to each other. And that makes a lot of sense to me because there's almost nothing that is totally uncorrelated. There's a really cool website called Spurious Correlations that you can look at. It talks about all the like random, highly correlated things in the world. And if you force things to be uncorrelated and they are actually correlated, you have completely missed it. So you might as well allow them to be correlated because it provides a better model fit and model solution, and you haven't missed it. 
And then sometimes what you'll notice is that they're too correlated for your own good. Okay, so if the correlations get too high, that's a, a suggestion that you have too many factors because those are so correlated, they're the same thing. The first, the first model on it, you wouldn't know, and you get a bad model. Uh, so I always suggest oblique rotations. I don't know that I know a scenario where I would suggest an orthogonal rotation because you might as well know if that correlation's there. And I work with people, and those things are always correlated, even if it's small. Bonus, if the model is truly uncorrelated, if your two factors are truly uncorrelated, the oblique solution will reduce to the orthogonal solution. So the oblique model will turn into an orthogonal model without you having to try. So there's really no reason to use an orthogonal solution. All right, so some um, orthogonal options are Veramax, Quartermax, and Equimax. Veramax is definitely the most popular. Uh, and I wish I could tell you that everything that ended in max was orthogonal, but it's not true. Oblique solutions also have Promax, but the most common option is Oblomen, okay, which is the one we'll use. And we hit this point pretty hard already, so don't do it. Use Oblomen. All right, so we're going to create a simple structure or a simple solution by choosing the appropriate type of math, in our case, maximum likelihood, and an orthogonal uh, <laughs> oblique rotation. And then now, what is the solution? Like, how do I get simple structure? I've talked about the setup. What is simple structure once I get there? And what we do is we look at the loadings. The loadings are the relationship between the item and that factor or component. I didn't fix that from my old notes. Mostly we're talking about factors and not PCA. And that is essentially the correlation between the factor and the uh, item. But we have picked a direction. So using correlation implies that it could go either way. But we've actually said we expect the factor to predict that item. Okay, the factor is the cause for that item. So it's really it's the factor predicting that item, because okay. we have two factor regressions in this case. And we, we want to have um, um, a minimum criteria. Now, you could argue over this criteria. You could go higher. Most people don't go lower. It is a bit arbitrary. Um, but the general thing that you'll see is that you want items to at least be related to their factor by 0.3. Why 0.3? Well, 0.3 is considered often considered a medium effect size or 10% of the variance. It's, a, it's just kind of a criteria, like a lower bound of like, this is what we find acceptable to be considered related. And that allows us to get rid of items that don't work. And when I say don't work, I mean they don't relate to anything. Okay, there's no factor. They don't just, they don't fit. Their variance is unique, which is bad. And they don't match anything else that's on the scale. So they're not really helping you out model-wise. That's one option. So these are items that don't load. They're not, they're poorly fitting. They don't match any of our factors. So let me give you a funny example. Helping friend develop a scale talking about um, different types of therapies, like psychological therapies. And <laughs> one of the questions was like, how pretentious do you think this therapy is? And we gave this to college freshmen, and that item did not work. She even had how pretentious snobby next to it, but it was just like clear that that particular wording of that item just did not work. People either didn't get it, they weren't paying enough attention. Our assumption was that the freshmen didn't quite know what the word meant. And they didn't match what they were trying to answer. And so you can, in your, you know, you can try your hardest to write really good questions, really good survey items, and they can just not work. I have written so many bad survey items, 
I could probably fill this room with them. So it's really common to write things that people just don't interpret in this in a way that matches your factor. To understand how they're um, if they're interpreting them the way you mean them is a different question. But you know, if five items tend to super highly correlate and they're all talking about the same thing, you can kind of get in a good idea that they're at least interpreting those five in the same way. And so we can get rid of items that don't load. But then there's an alternative problem um, that I apparently don't have a bullet point for here where items are too confusing. They, they, they load on multiple factors. And so you have a question that relates to this factor and that factor. And then that gets confusing. It's okay if our factors correlate, but if an item is on both factors and you're trying to create subscale scores, right? so I'm trying to make my openness to experience score and my neuroticism, and I have a question that loads on both, which one does it go to? Does it go to both? Does it go on one of them? Because then I'm using the data twice. So most people, at least in the scale development context, say that the rule is one and only one. So you take items that load on one factor and only one factor. So not more than one and not zero. Okay, zero items are just bad all around. But if they load on more than one, it begins then to be confusing how to what to do with them. And that's what this bullet point is about. From an exploratory kind of grouping perspective, it's okay if they load on more than one. So I have a, one of my very first papers actually is on how a lot of measures of semantic similarity um, load together in a factor analysis. And I remember being so proud of myself because I learned so much in my regression class and I told my, my faculty advisor like you're doing this all wrong. <laughs> and then I'll be darned if it wasn't a nearly orthogonal ro uh, solution. <laughs> so anywho. Um, the oblique solution reduced down to a nearly orthogonal solution, and I was chuffed. But um, anyway, in that particular analysis, it made sense to us that things loaded on more than one factor, and we weren't trying to develop a scale. So we let it load on more than one, and we talked about it. Like, here's why we think this is important. And so it's one and only one, it's kind of the, the rule for a simple structure. But do know that there are times when that may not be appropriate. So we're, these are all suggestions. After all that blah, 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 let's look at the actual code. So the, the function here is FA. Put in the data set. You do have to define a number of factors. So we're going to go with two because I know it works. We're going to use an Obelman rotation and then now FM for, um, I always call it factor math, but I don't think that's what it actually stands for, but it helps me remember we're going to use maximum likelihood. All right, so we're going to save that so that we can use it, but then let's print it out and look at it. So one thing, uh, if you install Psych and it doesn't install GPA rotation, it will get kind of mad at you. So, um, and it'll throw an error message. So be sure you also have GPA rotation installed. It is a dependency, but sometimes it just doesn't come along with it. Now, let's look at all this output. So first thing here is this is like the most important piece of the output personally. Okay. These are the standardized loadings. It's sometimes called the pattern matrix of the factors. So you'll see it labeled as ML1 and ML2. And that's because they're maximum likelihood 1, maximum likelihood 2. If you see them reversed, ML2 and ML1, whatever, it's fine. Okay. Um, it puts them in the order of the eigenvalues. So whichever eigenvalue is larger gets to go first. But whichever one it picked first. So if you have two very close eigenvalues, they can't flip. No big deal. The number in the column is the loading. I did not take the time to reverse score these. You should start by reverse scoring them. I didn't. 
because sometimes items cannot go the direction you expect. Right, so standard deviations excite me is number three here. And that is an item that should be negatively related to the rest. So I should have reverse coded it. And when by reverse coding, I mean taking one to five and flipping it, where the ones become fives, the twos become fours, three stays three. Um, and generally you do that so that they all are in the same direction. That doesn't really change any of the math here, it just changes the signs. And so I didn't need to, but interpretation wise, I probably should have. Right, so I've got my loadings here. H2 here is kind of like R squared. So it's the variance accounted for. U2 here is the uniqueness value, which is one minus H2. So you want those numbers to be bigger, meaning you're accounting for more variance. The smaller it is, the worse the item is. And then I don't really totally understand how it calculates complexity over here, so I mostly ignore that column. But that's what the column is. All right, now let's see, how would we interpret this? So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna show you each item one at a time. So I've got um, question one, looks like it correlates best with factor one, and does it correlate with factor two? So that is a good item. Question two here correlates with factor one and not factor two. Three is the same, four is the same, five is the same, six, Seven, okay, eight here correlates with factor two. Nine looks good, 10, 11, 12. You can tell this is made up data, right? 13, I think it's made up, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, all looking good until we hit 23. So 23 is an item that doesn't load on anything. Those factor correlations are very small. And so we can see that that affects its R squared value. Okay. So it doesn't really um, get accounted for because we're predicting it right with our factor. And it's mostly unique variants. So we're going to want to rerun this analysis and exclude that item. And this is common, this sort of whittling down procedure. So let's do that. Before I even talk about the rest of the output, let's do that. Oops, too many clicks. So I took out item 23 here, just use the negative sign to temporarily drop 23. I didn't create a new data set. I just said, don't rerun the analysis without that data. And now let's look again. An important point here. If you have a bunch of bad items on round one, you can eliminate them all at once. Okay. So let's say five items are bad, you can go through and eliminate all five. Or you can pick them and do them one at a time, but I usually do them in blocks. So like these five are bad, next round. These two are bad, next round, everything's fine. So you might run five or six rounds before you get to simple structure. Okay, I have some nice examples that will treat you, treat you well. So you don't have to run five rounds. But I have had data sets where I ran a bunch of rounds and they just never resolved. It just always looked bad. And that's a sign that I need to try a different number of factors. Or I've had data sets where I was trying four factors and I would slowly eliminate the number of items and a whole factor would disappear because nothing would load on it. And that's a sign I have too many factors. So I went and went down to three and saw what happened. Um, so you can overfactor. you can have too many points. Okay. And generally what you'll see happen is you don't have enough items on the factor when you're done, so you need at least three or four. And then as you are eliminating bad items, what will happen is a factor will disappear. Now it won't literally disappear out of your output. It'll disappear in the sense that all of the loadings will be very small, so there's nothing that it, that factor predicts. All right, let's look at round two here. And a good, a good model will not change that much. Because if you remove one item and suddenly all these numbers change, something weird is going on. So let's see, okay. One, 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 two. One, one, two. One, one, yada, 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 two, one, 
one. So more on factor one, not as many on factor two. But they pretty much stayed stable except for that last item. So in that case, this is our simple structure. So we have achieved simple structure. Okay, they've all loaded on one and only one. Now let's come down and look at the rest of the output. Uh, this SS loadings, I think is the eigenvalues. No, we didn't have any that were that high. I forget what this is. Um, but it does give me like a proportion of variance kind of accounted for um, by looking at the, uh, the eigenvalue over the total. I don't think we had two of them over, over uh, one. Right, so that doesn't make sense. It is the eigenvalue, but we didn't. Hold on, let me back up. At least according to the book. Huh? Well, <laughs> my problem with that is it does not match this. Hmm. Or the graph. Maybe. No, no, it said that well, the other one was close to two. Hmm. I don't ever use that number, so I'm okay. I can't remember what it is, to, to be totally honest with you. I'm usually more interested in this proportion of variance. Okay. So that first item account, our first factor accounts for a quarter of variance. It's not bad. And the second one adds another 10%. The factor correlations are also really good to look at. You don't want these to be too high. And we'll discuss later um, that once you get into the 0.8 range and 0 0.8, 0 0.9, that's going to be way too high. This is pretty high. 0 0.6, that's a lot of overlap between these. So I'm kind of amazed at how we were able to get the structure to settle and not have too many of them that were on both um, columns. Um, but you know, if it gets too high, you're going to have, you're going to have mathematical issues of running the analysis and then just interpretation. When they're that high, why are you running multiple factors? All right, scroll, scroll, scroll. We're going to mostly ignore most of this and we're going to come back and talk about these fit indices here in a few minutes. Okay, so I'm mostly going to skip them right now. Um, but they are written out in the output, just FYI. Now I do love the plot functions in Psych. Now I don't, you don't have a lot of control over them when we get into the into the simplot package, which will put our Levon models in and it'll draw us the picture. You have a little bit of control. Uh, this just kind of gives us a nice quick visual of what's happening. <clears throat> and what we can see, uh, what you do for fa.plot is you put in the final model, so EFA fit 2, and then to give it labels, I put in the column names. And so we've got these three items together over here that are in blue that are factor 2, I think, and then all of these that are factor 1. And it almost looks like this splits into three. Right? And so when you get this nine, kind of nice split, you should really probably look at three. Now, I also didn't reverse code these, so that might be part of my problem. I will tell you that reverse coded items, when I develop scales, I try very hard not to use them anymore because the original idea with reverse coded items, like um, where everything's positive and you have a negative item, or in our case, the scale is everything's bad and then I love standard deviations, right? Uh, what I have found is that those tend to factor onto their own factor just because they're negatively worded okay, or vice versa and that can be that is not a real latent variable that's the fact that they're all the negative ones and so sometimes you just wonder you know are people interpreting those right so what i might try here is running three and seeing if they give me you know, is it all the negative ones together? Well, then it's probably two, and I the wording is what's causing that separation. Or is this, you know, different math versus computers? I'm not math, uh, coding versus computers. So that's what I would do. I would continue to run more models here, kind of investigate that. But in the essence of time, let's look at the other cool plot, which is fa.diagram. 
And this brings us back to the beginning of the lecture where we talked about how you see these drawn. Now, these should be circles. <laughs> They're not, but they should be circles because these are our latent variables. And here's the factor co correlation between them, 0.6. All of these here are the standardized loadings. The ones you get in the dash are negative. And then the, the separation here is that we've got them only loading on one. Okay, so these bottom three together and then the rest of them are a giant factor. Now at this stage, there are a couple of ways that I could go. I could stop here and look at the next step, which, we'll get, which is what we're gonna do. Or I could go, you know, I don't really need 15 items for this. If they're all really highly related, I could probably get away with like four or five and shorten the whole thing down. And that's what we were aiming for. So we built 200 plus items so that we could find the bad ones, get rid of those, and then pick only the best ones. And so we, we went from 200 items to 18 because we selected the best two in a bunch of categories that we had. Um, so I could stop right here and like take out everything below 0.5 and just make sure that those items still fit together. Okay, that's an option. So you can move the criteria up. You usually can't move it down. And by criteria, I mean the 0.3 criteria. So an adequate solution is a measure of how well that model fits the data. So we've built this two-factor model, this separation. How well does that fit? And so we'll look at two types of fit indices. Okay, I'm going to loosely cluster these into goodness of fit indices and badness of fit indices. This is not quite how a lot of books describe them, but I think as we go, this really helps under people understand how to interpret them. And then... Not next week, but I think the week after next, we'll cover fit indices a lot more. So we'll really go into depth of like, how are they calculated? Um, you won't have to do the math yourself, but looking at the math kind of gives you an idea of how they're related. Uh, what are the classifications? Because there's actually about four different main types. But in general, if you get the idea, there's goodness of fit indices, badness of fit indices, and comparative indices, which we're not going to look at. Uh, goodness of fit indices measure the overlap between essentially the data and the model. The model is this idea of like the reproduced correlation matrix. So I have the correlation matrix from the data, you know, minus that bad column we dropped. And then I have my model that suggests this is what the relationship is between the variables. And I can reproduce the correlation matrix. And then it's essentially a correlation of those two things. So how much does the original correlation matrix look like the reproduced correlation matrix? If we're asking how much they match, it's a goodness of fit, and we want numbers close to 1. So uh, numbers above 0.9 are usually considered good. Okay. A badness of fit stati statistic, so distic, statistic, uh, um, sometimes called residual statistics, it's just like residuals and regression. It's how far apart those two things are. Reproduced minus the original and sum that up. Not quite how it works, but that's the idea. And we want numbers close to zero. We want the model to reproduce the data. So when you subtract them, you should get very close. So we want numbers very small. Correspondingly, things below 0.10 also can, can seem pretty good. So fit indices are a good measure. The interpretation of the model is a good measure, right? So does it make sense? Back to my flight, 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 freeze questionnaire. Three, she wanted three. <laughs> it took us five different versions of this scale to get to three. And we would get really good models. We would have these amazingly well-fit models with two factors. And the research team was like, no, we want three. So we would try again. And so theory might be a driving factor. Um, this item makes no sense on that factor. Let's take it out. Because it, like, face validity-wise, does not work. Meaning they're not interpreting it the way that we expect. And then we'll also do reliability in the form of Chromebox Alpha. 
So notice here we haven't really covered validity and that's kind of a whole different set of measurement statistics of comparing your, your um, scale to maybe a gold standard, that kind of thing. So let's look at our fit indices. So here we're going to um, pull out the root mean square of the residuals or the RMSR. It's going to be so much alphabet soup. There are so many of these. I think the joke for a long time was every, every time someone publishes a paper, a new fit indice is born. I mean, there are just so many of them, and I'm just going to show you the super common ones um, that most people report. But I will tell you it's kind of all over the place. So the RMSR, and this is a residual statistic. So if it starts with R, it's probably a badness of fit statistic. And so we want that number to be small. So 0.05 is pretty good. The RMSCA is the most popular statistic. I would be very surprised if people try to report an analysis without the RIMC. And it's also a residual statistic, the root mean squared error of approximation. And you want this to be small. You do get a 90% confidence interval automatically. The Tucker-Lewis index is a very popular goodness of fit statistic. Sometimes this is called the NNFI, the non-normed fit index. Unfortunately, here we want this to be above 0.9, so it's not cutting it. And then I don't know why psych does not um, include the comparative fit index, but the CFI is the second most popular one. And so I would say that if you see a model, generally people report REMC and CFI. And if I'm reviewing your model, because I review a lot of these, I'm going to make you report both of those. <laughs> because they, they kind of approach fit in different ways that uh, tell you something good. You really want both of them to be good. The CFI you can calculate manually. I've got the formula here, but it's chi-square minus degrees of freedom for your model divided by chi-square from the null model where nothing is related minus degrees of freedom for the null model. This is a ratio and then one minus that ratio. And you'll know that you've gotten it if you're using the right formula when it's just slightly higher than the TLI. That's always how I know that I haven't screwed up my parentheses somewhere. Uh, and it's still not good. So do I have the numbers in here? No. I didn't even write them down in this set of slides. The general rules of thumb are um, below 0.10 and above 0.9 are acceptable. Below 0.06, because that's different. 0.06 is considered good for the residuals. And above 0.95, they don't match is good for the goodness of fit statistics. But if you can remember 0.10 and 0.9, you'll be all right. And so what we have here is a mix, and a mix, some good, some bad. And that's really common. And we won't cover this tonight, but we'll talk um, when we get into path models and confirmatory factor analysis, like how might we improve the model? Okay, there are things that we could look at to help improve. With EFA, it's a little bit harder, but with C, uh, confirmatory analyses, there are things that we can test for to see where we might improve. And then let's end with reliability and interpretation. So all I've done here is um, put which items went with which factor. That very visually is easy to see on these pictures. Or if you look at the pattern matrixes, which one has the high, the loading, so the stronger loading. Okay, oops, no, I don't want the picture, thank you. Okay. And so all I did was just like, you know, this, this is the column numbers that go with the first factor, and here are the column numbers that go with the second factor. I will tell you, if you load psych and ggplot at the same time, you will have this kind of competition for the alpha function. This took a long time for me to figure out. <laughs> and then it would tell me that I couldn't map a color. And I was like, well, I'm not trying to map a color. I'm trying to calculate Chromebooks Alpha. What is happening? And so if you are going to run Psych, um, the version of Alpha, I would just stick Psych right in front of it so that it knows which package to pull it from. If you don't load them at the same time, they don't interact, but I often have both of them open. So 
just FYI, it's not technically necessary until you get this weird error message. And so I told it to just run, give me factor one, only those columns. So when you calculate reliability, it should be separate for each factor. I turned on check keys equals true because I was too lazy to reverse score them at the beginning. And then it more, it said, yeah, this is, you should have reversed these. <laughs> so it gave me a warning. And then the output is kind of verbose, but let's see what we need here. Mostly you're interested in raw alpha, and that's the reliability coefficient. And I forget, every day is a different rule, but generally the one I stick with is 0.7, where you want items to hang together. So this is a measure of how much the items hang together or tend to be kind of related to each other. You can also see the confidence interval. And then if the scores are low, you can maybe figure out which item it is. So this is the score if that item is dropped. And so um, you would look for like really low. It's like essentially the one, the, the alpha without that item. So you want to make sure that they're not all over the place. And then it also very nicely gives you this like correlation, like all this crazy stuff, the means, the standard deviations. So you can see from my negatively keyed items how much lower the score is, so I should have reversed them. Like it gives you a ton of cool stuff. Also gives you the response patterns, right? So it actually gives you the like distribution for um, each response if they're kind of uh, interval like this. So let's look at the second one. The second one is also good. So our model fit statistics are kind of hit and miss, but our reliabilities are good. Now these are lower. Why? Well, a three item factor is kind of the lower limit. So we really should have more items on this. <laughs> three is not good. Four is better. Three is like as minimal as possible. If people tell you you can get away with two, you can after this semester you can tell them why they're lying. Okay. Three is kind of the minimum. And so anytime that you drop one, obviously the reliability is going to drop because you're only working with two. So um, it's it's easier to have more reliable scales with more items. Just FYI. All right. So mix and match here. We've got fit in the C's that don't quite work, but the reliability is good. Let's look at theory now. It's our last step. And my interpretation here is going to be that this first item is about mostly um, about the the computers, but also a little bit of, of like statistics. Now I know that statistics and math are highly related, but we've got kind of a mix here of like statistics questions, right, and computer questions. So um, it's kind of a mix of like statistics and R and then factor two here if I can get it to come down to is is the specific math questions so those are the ones that specifically say math or an equation now I know an eigenvector is a mathematical thing but it tends to get more related to statistics so this first factor is kind of a muddle right because I could easily see separating out like questions like one and three and four, which are and five, okay, which are like clear statistics concepts and computer questions. So what I would do with this picture, right? I have simple structure, okay, but when I'm looking at the, the, the two-dimensional plot, it might be that this is three because they separate out on that factor. There are two ends of the spectrum. Right, statistics and the way we're calculating statistics with the computer. Uh, and then the math question. My fit indices are mixed. Reliability is good. Interpretation is kind of mixed too. So I would try this again with three factors and see what happens. And I might find that that model fits better and is a better representation of what's going on in this data.
but in the interest of time, we won't do that. <laughs> what that is like practically if I was running this as a, that's the next step I would take is saying, well, this model is not the greatest. Let's try three and then compare and contrast. So to sum all that up, you learned about EFA and I've really um, put this forward as a scale development approach because that is a lot of what people use EFA for, but it's really what people use CFA for. So um, do know that there are other things you can do with EFA and those rules kind of still hold. And then within that, we've thought about what are the possible number of latent variables? Because once we get to confirmatory analysis, you need to know. You know how many latent variables because you program it yourself. You tell the uh, the measured items where to go. It's usually based on this type of pre-analysis. We've learned how to get simple structure because simple structure helps us build these confirmatory models and interpretation, all that kind of stuff. And then we looked at how we can determine if simple structure is adequate. Does that model, is that model any good? Because I can get to a simple model that isn't any good. And we're kind of in a weird spot. It's like half good. So I should explore other models to see if I is better. All right.